Well, thanks for inviting me to join you today. It really is a privilege. Uh, Barry reached out to me a couple of months ago and asked me if I would uh, if I would do this. And I just thought, yeah, I mean, I didn't have to think uh, think for a minute. Um, and so, again, appreciate the chance to be with you this morning. Um, Barry said a little bit about my background. I'll fill that in a little bit more. <clears throat> Um, my PhD is in psychology, and I practiced clinically for about 10 years first, um, and then I transitioned to business psychology. And nobody really knows what business psychology is, but basically what it is is um, we apply, we apply uh, psychological principles to the workplace. So um, you think about how much getting work done relies on the people stuff. Um, that's the area that we focus on. So we kind of talk about us as, as growing people and shrinking people problems, um, that sort of thing. So we work mostly with um, small and medium sized businesses. Probably about 10 to 15% of our work is with ministries and nonprofits um, as well. So, um, and the kind of things we do, we do a lot of leadership coaching, executive coaching. Um, we help a lot of, um, a lot of times when businesses are experiencing conflict among their leaders, we'll help them work out those conflicts. We work with a lot of family businesses. Family businesses just have some unique challenges when you work with the people that are your family. Um, and we help them sometimes in um, moving next generation into the business, that sort of thing. Sometimes we help uh, companies with selecting leaders. We help churches with governance. So a variety of things, but most of it centers around just the people side of organizational life or of business. Um, I also served, um, uh, I served uh, for a, a number of years, LCBC Church uh, up the road a bit here. Um, I'd been an elder for about five years. And then after being an elder, I was on staff uh, for a few years as well. And um, my role there was, um, I, I oversaw the ministry area. So the pastors reported up through me. I had that role for about five years. Um, and essentially the role was to build into the leadership of the church so that we could grow from a church of 2,000 to 5,000. And I was in that role till we were about 6,000. Um, but over the, past, uh, over the past 25 years now have been, um, have been again, mostly working with businesses and, and some um, ministry organizations. So I understand today we do have a kind of a blend of uh, backgrounds in the room here. And so I am kind of curious, how many of you are in vocational ministry? Your job is in ministry. Okay, pretty good. And so leave your hands up. And how many of you are like lead pastors in that group, like the leader of a church? Okay, good. All right. And how many of you um, more come from, uh, I, I'd say, lead a, um, not a church, but like a, um, a nonprofit organization or you're involved in a nonprofit organization? Okay, good number there. Okay. And then how many of you are, um, uh, you know, you own a business or you work in a business, but your primary day-to-day -day stuff is business related? Okay, good group of you too. Okay, great. All right, well, um, we're gonna be talking today about derailers and boundaries, all right? And, you know, when we think about when, um, when a leader derails, um, they don't just go off the rails themselves. They just drag a lot of other people down with them, all right? And you think particularly when this happens in the ministry world, in the church world, it just damages the reputation of the church. Uh, it's just critical that, um, that we be on guard uh, against these derail derailers to our leadership. And look, um, I'm going to name a couple of names here, and these are all things that are in public light, but but, you know, um, many of us might know what happened with Bill Hybels. Um, you know, he uh, led a, a thriving ministry and, um, and he derailed um, because really of some uh, sexual misjudgment. Um, you know, similar Rob, Robbie Zacharias. I, I mean, you know, the, the damage this does, um, you know, Mark Driscoll um, had anger control problems. Um, we see these things and, and we all know of, it, we all know of stories in our communities as well, where there's been, uh, you know, some some pastor who's gone off the rails, and and it's really done damage um, to the reputation of the church. And so, I'm with you today for two sessions, and each session slated to have about 55 minutes of presentation time, followed by either 15 or 20 minutes of, of table talk. Now. Um, I'm going to break the rules a little bit on the structure here. Now, first of all, I'll say I do promise to give you a break at 1030 and at 1045. But the way I've carved things up, um, you know, the table talk isn't necessarily at the end of a session. 
And also, we probably have a little stronger emphasis on leadership derailment than on boundaries. So we'll spend a little more time on the derailment than the boundaries per se. So I appreciate the flexibility that I'm sure you will grant me in uh, <laughs> adjusting our time a little bit there. So let's get into this. Um, and by the way, um, you know, it's, it's fine to uh, ask a question here and there as I'm presenting. Um, if, uh, but I do want to get through the material, so, you know, so I'll try to manage that the best I can, but certainly happy to answer questions along the way. But uh, basically, we're going to divide our time into these two segments, with the first one focusing on derailment, second focusing on setting and maintaining boundaries. And um, as I was organizing this, I was thinking, you know, really, these are two sides of the same coin, right? I mean, they're really both about establishing lines and limits for the purpose of protection lines and limits for the purpose of protection. So a way we can kind of look at this, if you look at the top line here, preventing derailment is mainly about protecting the outside from what's inside, okay? I'm trying to protect the, the people, the organization, the people that I, that I influence, I'm trying to protect that from kind of the dark side of what's in me, all right? When we derail, um, we slip and we let some bad things out <laughs> that have a negative impact, all right? And so, you know, we can talk about it as about pre presenting escapes or breakouts or unleashings of a dark side that, that all of us have. When we're talking more about setting boundaries, normally we're thinking about protecting the inside from what's outside, right? All these things that are competing for our time and, 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 and uh, can push into, our, push into us and, and, and harm our well-being or harm our functioning in work, at home, um, in our marriages, these sorts of things. Okay, so conceptually, that's kind of how I'm framing it up today. The derailers protecting the outside from what's inside and boundaries protecting the inside from what's outside. Oh, and I should mention, um, these slides, um, the slide deck will be mailed to, as long as you sort of signed up <laughs> with your email address, um, Emily is going to send the slides to everybody um, uh, tomorrow, I believe. So you'll have all of these slides. And uh, there's another tool I'll talk about at the end that you'll also get as a PDF. So um, you don't have to take frantic, no frantic notes if you, if you were planning to do that. So, um, so when we're talking about managing derailers, you, you know, kind of have to ask the question, like what's inside, what's inside of me that may create problems if it escapes, you know? And so it's about like, you ought to know what's in there and how it can be dangerous. So very important for us as leaders to see clearly what's on the inside and the danger that's posed by possible breakouts. So I'm going to talk a bit about um, blind spots and, and how we can uncover our blind spots. I'm going to talk about how we build self-awareness because this is just absolutely key to being able to manage derailment effectively. And kind of the theme is like focus on containment, right? There's something, there's something in us that we have to make sure it doesn't get out in unhealthy ways. All right. And, and you, know, you think about this, like if you're trying to, if you're trying to keep a cow from escaping, you know, what's the boundary? You build a fence, right? Uh, if you're trying to keep a canary from escaping, you don't build a fence, it's gonna fly right through it. You build a cage. And to some extent, when we think about what are my potential derailers, we have to customize it a bit, all right? The same thing doesn't work for everybody. All right, so let's talk about blind spots. Um, so I'm 60 years old, all right? <laughs> and, um, and my vision isn't what it used to be. and when, when you can't see clearly, even some simple things pretty, uh, can be pretty difficult. Is there anyone in here who enjoys fishing? Okay, I love to fish. I'm not particularly good at it, but I love to fish. And, you know, I used to be able to tie knots really easily, but when I'm working with thin line, I can't see the knots. <laughs> okay, I, I can't tie a knot anymore, so I have to get these, my kids make fun of me. I got these glasses that they're sunglasses, but they've got these little, uh, you know, little bifocal thing <laughs> built in there, so. Um, but that's what I have to do to be able to get my vision in good shape. Um, you know, I also have like, I'm both farsighted and nearsighted. So I've got one contact that allows me to see what's out there and one that allows me to see what's up here, but I can't see anything in the middle. So, <laughs> so <laughs> you know, so if I'm in a store and I'm sort of standing behind a counter and there's items back there that have a price tag, I, I you know, I have no idea what these things cost. <laughs> but, 
<laughs> so, but you know, you, the way that our eyes are designed, we all have a blind spot in our field of vision. And that's caused because this portion of our retinas, um, there's a portion of our retinas where our optic nerve exits. And so your brain sort of fills in the gaps on that, but, but it is a blind spot. And when we're driving a car, we might have a blind spot in our rear view mirrors. And it, that can be dangerous if you try to switch lanes when another vehicle's there. And, and look, none of us see ourselves with perfect, perfect clarity, okay? You don't see yourself with perfect clarity. All right. So leaders tend to develop blind spots, which I'm going to define as an attitude or behavior pattern that we cannot see in ourselves, yet has a damaging influence on our effectiveness. Okay. So let me tell you a story here. Um, I mentioned I was on staff at LCBC for, um, uh, for a few years, and one of the practices we would often engage in with our staff was, um, um, we, were about, we were a church that uh, was about um, uh, reaching unbelievers and, and seeing more people to come to Christ, as many churches are. Um, but, uh, but we expected to grow, and we were planful about growing. Um, and so, so we would often visit churches that were larger than ourselves to help us learn and prepare effectively for growth. So we would often take field trips to other churches and learn what we could from them. And so some time ago, we, uh, we went to this large church, and it was kind of interesting. The, the lead pastor there was a very charismatic leader, um, uh, you know, sort of a very attractive figure. And his personality figured very heavily into the organization's brand. So much so that, like, you know, we went to the bookstore as part of our little tour. And we're in the big bookstore, and his artwork is like big section of the bookstore, okay? Now, I'm no art critic. I can barely <laughs> draw a stick figure. And I, I can't tell you if his artwork was higher or lower quality than Hunter Biden's, for example, but, um, <laughs> but, but you know, it wasn't all that impressive, I didn't think, but, but he had this big section of his artwork for sale, okay? You move a couple aisles over, and there was another section of a whole lot of things for sale, and it was his wife's exercise videos. And it's like, oh boy, you know, it's just kind of, you, you get this sort of like creepy feel from that. So anyway, you know, so this church is kind of teaching other churches how to do church. So I'm in a group with people who do what I did at the church. And then a colleague of mine was in a group with people who did what he did at the church. And this church had a beautiful campus. And, you know, I mentioned I like to fish and there was this wonderful pond right outside the church. So I told my buddy, I said, you know, if I worked here, I wouldn't get a thing done because I'd be sitting in my window looking at that pond and I wouldn't be out there catching fish rather than, rather than like working for the church. And so, um, so he said, well, uh, he said, no, no, you wouldn't be out at that pond. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, the senior pastor is the only one who gets to use that pond. He said, he likes to fish, yeah, you know, um, and no one else can use that pond. I'm thinking, holy smokes, okay. <laughs> Um, and, and so, you know, you kind of, this was a church, all right? This was a well-known church. And, you know, you think, oh, what do you think was a blind spot for that leader? Any guesses? I mean, what? You look at that. Yeah. What's that? Pride. Yeah, I think pride's an element in there. Kind of. Yeah, narcissism. Yeah, there's kind of a self-centeredness, you know? I get to fish here, but you people don't. So I'm especially sensitive to that, of course, because I like to fish. But, uh, but I don't know. This guy. <laughs> but look, you know, again, it's not hard to think of leaders who crashed hard, you know, when they were at the peak of their success. And oftentimes it's these little things that sort of gnaw away and other people see it, um, but it's not really confronted. So a few things about blind spots. Um, your blind spots may be clearly visible to those around you, but that doesn't mean others are dying to tell you about them. Okay. So, and I'm going to say, especially if you're a leader in business or a leader in church, other people see your blind spots, but they're not going to tell you about them. Um, it's dangerous to speak truth to a leader. All right. It's dangerous to speak truth to a leader. Uh, you know, the people on your team don't want to look like they're negative. Um, you know, the, the higher you rise in position and power in an organization, the less likely you are to hear meaningful critical feedback 
about yourself. All right. Um, now, blind spots sometimes look very spiritual. They sometimes look very spiritual. And um, so, uh, so I'm going to be a little careful about what I say here, but um, I'll sometimes encounter people who uh, they're, they're, tr they're trying to advocate for something they want to see happen or what have you. And they'll, and they'll use phrasing something like this. I just really felt the spirit leading me to say this, you know? And, um, you know, I, I don't want to devalue that, uh, but, um, I, you know, that sometimes can be coercion masquerading as spirituality, right? I mean, um, <laughs> you know, uh, it, it's, it, it can be sort of a, like that sort of shuts down the argument, right? I can't disagree. If God told you to do this, you know, I can't disagree with you on that. So, so look, I'm not saying that God doesn't tell us things and I'm not, you, you know, and I'm not trying to belittle anyone's sensitivity to the spirit. Um, but I am saying be careful with that because that can be abused. And, and when you're interacting with that, um, you know, I mean, you may have to find sort of a polite way to counter that. Um, you know, I probably don't want to say, well, the spirit told me this, but, <laughs> but, 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 you know, that's an example of a, of a blind spot that we often, that expresses itself spiritually. Huh. You know, I, I, I sometimes will see leaders <laughs> saying things like, I'm just so humbled to share the stage with my good friend, John Maxwell, you know, and I go, well, is that humility? Uh, you know, you're kind of making yourself look important because you know someone who's famous. Um, <laughs> okay. um, probably the worst though. Um, so, and here I'm gonna speak a bit to the business leaders in the room. So um, I have a, uh, uh, a friend who is not a Christian. He knows I am. He interacts with a lot, his role um, he interacts with a lot of businesses and knows a lot of business leaders because of his role. And we were talking one time and he said, you know, he said, I know a lot of the Christian businesses around here. And he said, a lot of them, they kind of put their values, they wear their faith on their sleeve. Um, and he said, when you look at their culture, he said, they do not treat their people well. He said, they're the kind of cultures. He just says, it's just, it's just awful. Now, you know, he did recognize others. He named some that he just said, now here's one that I think really, really lives it. But he said, I see so many of these supposed Christian organizations. They've got it up on the wall, but they're stingy with their workers. They're demanding of their workers. They might, they might give money some places, but, but the cultures they create uh, don't, don't reflect, you know, what you would think Christ's values would be. So, um, so interesting. So I, I talked to that guy and then, uh, you know, a week or two later, I was having lunch with a friend of mine who is a believer and who like me, um, his customers, his clients are a lot of, you know, I, I, I work with Christian and non Christian businesses, but a lot of Christian leaders. So this was a guy who does, uh, who works with a lot of Christian business leaders as well. So I was telling him <clears throat> this story about this other guy uh, and this, these horrible things you see him. And this guy says to me, yeah, he said, I just, I see that a lot and it's distressing. And he said, uh, I call those guys tithing bastards. And I was like, oh, <laughs> you know, and I'm sitting here thinking like, you know, now, now I have to confess, I have to confess to you here that when I heard that tithing bastards, um, my first thought was that is just absolutely an awesome name for an edgy worship band. <laughs> so I'm thinking like, I mean, I could see the ripped jeans there, the tattoos, flashing lights flying across the stage. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you might guess one of my derailers is like, you don't have to say everything that comes into your head. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, so it's, it, it's sad that other people see this in us, um, that we don't see that in ourselves. Um, there's a book called Leadership Blind Spots, um, written by a guy named Robert Shaw. And, and this is on that third point. Our, our blind spots are often found in close proximity to our strengths. So Robert Shaw in his book, Leadership Blind Spots, he notes that leaders who are deeply passionate um, they can believe in their own views so much that they, dis they dismiss contrary views 
or information that doesn't fit their preconceived notions. Passionate leaders tend to steamroll over other people. All right. Um, I'm going to say more about this idea of how strengths can become weaknesses uh, in a little bit here. Um, I say that on the fourth point, our blind spots might be relatively small or not so small. I'll give you examples of a couple. Um, I was once coaching uh, an account executive at a marketing firm. And part of what we were working on was she just wasn't empowering her people. And so everyone had to come to her and she was way overloaded and there's just a big bottleneck to things getting done in the organizations. I've been working and working with her on, you know, don't just tell people what to do, ask them good questions so they think and then they'll learn how to do it themselves. So, you know, so I'm in a, uh, I'm in a uh, meeting with her in her office and, and I'm just asking, her, how are you doing on that? She says, I'm great, I'm just really nailing it. And then there's a knock on her door and some pokes their head in the office and they ask her a question. And I'm thinking, this is a great chance to see if she's got this. <laughs> and she's just like firing off <laughs> instructions to this person. And I was like, did you see what you just did there? Okay. So she didn't really see it and she needed help seeing it. Um, maybe a more significant issue um, as an example is um, I uh, had coached a, a CEO of a manufacturing, uh, sort of medium-sized manufacturing organization. And he was telling me how he was getting frustrated because he was never hearing about problems until they were really big problems. And he was saying, I just, he said, I can't, I, I'm, I'm having trouble trusting my team because they just don't tell me about things until it's like a huge issue. Okay, so I said, well, let me talk to your team members and see what's going on there. So I interviewed his people and, you know, I heard things like, boy, um, <laughs> uh, you don't want to, the smartest thing to do around this place is if there's a problem, just duck your head, hope you can solve it before he ever knows about it. Because, because if he knows their problem and, and it comes out in a meeting, he will, he, they said, he will rip you a new one. He will rip you a new one. <laughs> okay. And, um, you know, so I went back to him. I said, you know, I think part of the problem is just how you're, how you're responding to problems and people are afraid of you. You're making yourself unapproachable. Okay. So really for this guy, we had to monitor his intensity. I had to have him like built a worksheet out for this guy to monitor the, the um, intensity of his emotions, to look at, um, to look at um, how people were responding, what the outcome was, what he could have done differently, and really had to work with him on adjusting that. It had been a pretty big blind spot that he thought was a problem with his team. It was really a problem with himself. Um, Others will overlook your blind spots, especially in a leader, so long as you're getting good results, okay? So, uh, you know, I've encountered, uh, uh, you know, I mentioned we do some governance work and sometimes we're called in to clean up after something went wrong in an organization. People say, how could we have missed this? And so we'll help boards govern effectively. But one of the things that we'll see oftentimes is people will know a leader's blind spots. They'll know it. Your board might know it. The uh, key employees might know it about you, um, but they kind of say, ah, don't mess with success. We're getting good results. People are coming to the church. We know this is a problem with this pastor. We know this is a problem with this leader, but we're getting good results, so don't mess with success. So sometimes your blind spots will be overlooked just because you're getting decent results. Um, I'm not gonna act like a blind spot is going to necessarily lead to catastrophic derailment every time but it will eventually diminish your effectiveness in serving God. So let's talk a little bit about how strengths can become derailers. So you can see on the left, these are some qualities that we really might look for in a good leader, right? Confident and assertive, innovative and creative, detailed and conscientious, you know, they follow through well, they pay attention to the details charming and interesting, they're engaging, um, supportive and loyal, independent and, ob and objective. They can kind of see things for what they really are. They're willing to, um, they're willing to give their real opinions on things. Maybe they're intense and energetic. These are all things we might consider to be strengths, right? So um, now this, uh, uh, so I'm gonna suggest to you that um, there is a dark side to, to many of our strengths. There's a tool that we use um, um, as psychologists, we're oftentimes employing assessments when we're helping develop leaders or when we're helping an organization. Um, you know, if they have candidates for a high level role, we'll help, uh, we'll help them in the decision-making around that. 
Um, but there's this, um, there's a particular tool that we'd like to use. It's called the Hogan Development Survey. And, um, and this uh, tool is designed specifically to uh, detect what are called dark side aspects of personality. Things that in moderation may show up as strengths, but they may emerge as derailers when the individual is stressed, bored, or fatigued, all right? So, and I'll just, I'll say quickly here, um, we often use this, there's sort of a suite of tools here that go together. They have this Hogan personality invent inventory, which is designed to pick up on bright side aspects of personality. It's, it's um, sort of the you that shows up every day at work. This Hogan development survey is not the you that shows up every day. It's more the you that may emerge if you're bored, stressed, or fatigued. And then they have another companion instrument with that that taps into a person's core values, what you care about. Um, and so we'll oftentimes give these together to someone. But, um, but again, you're more at risk for derailment when you are stressed or burned out, um, which is why the next part of our discussion around boundaries is especially important. So, so it's really helpful when you look at your strengths that you also consider how might that strength emerge as a liability when it's overplayed, all right? So, um, so I'm just gonna um, show you a little bit about how this, uh, how this uh, tool, that's <laughs> um, not so much how it works, but what the, uh, what the uh, corollary to the strength might be uh, uh, in, in a weakness. So confident and assertive, when that's uh, overplayed, uh, it may come off as entitled, as arrogant, or as overestimating one's competence, right? Um, the strength of being innovative and creative. Well, um, ideas might seem kind of eccentric, um, might be kind of impractical, might lack focus. Someone who's detailed and conscientious, um, when that strength gets overplayed, um, they're likely to come out, they may be likely to come out as micromanaging, as perfectionistic, as nitpicking. Someone who's charming and interesting, um, they're engaging. Um, well, sometimes uh, those people, when their strengths are overplayed, you see risk-taking behavior, they test limits, can be untrustworthy, maybe a little bit manipulative. People who are supportive and loyal on the bright side um, may come off as over-eager to please, deferential, ingratiating, when that strength is out of whack. People are independent and objective. Um, they may come, up, uh, uh, come out as sort of socially withdrawn, as overly tough, as uncommunicative when that strength gets out of balance. And finally, uh, people who are intense and energetic may come off as moody, inconsistent, volatile, and unpredictable. So I'm not giving you sort of the whole list, but I just wanted to give you some examples of how these things that oftentimes show up as strengths for us play out as weaknesses um, when we're not on guard, all right? So I'm just kind of curious. I mean, any other thoughts that you've seen either in yourself or, um, or in, in others? Uh, don't name names or anything, but you've seen it in others where, where, <laughs> where something that kind of shows up mostly as a strength can cross the line and show up as a weakness or a liability. Any examples? Yeah. Okay, that you as a, as a confident leader, your people may start worshiping you. Yeah, okay, yeah, good example. Yeah, another one? Intelligence can show up as over introspection. Okay, yeah, thinking it too much, uh, thinking it through too much, looking too much inside, sure. Any other examples of where you've seen or you've had seen in yourself? Uh, trusting in to lack of wisdom in the reality of the fall of man. Yeah, okay. Yeah, trusting can, you, you can get burned if that, if that um, strength kind of slips to the dark side. All right, good. These are great examples. And I think it's really important to think this through for yourself. Um, you know, uh, people will oftentimes ask you, what are your strengths and play to your strengths. But there is a dark side to strengths that if we want to prevent derailer, we have to be attentive to it and we have to guard against it. So what I'd like you to do for, uh, I guess we have about 15 minutes for this. Uh, well, uh, let me give you an example to, or two first, but um, I, I'm gonna ask you to talk about a time at your tables when you discovered or were told about a blind spot of yours. So 
Uh, so I'm going to disclose a little bit here. Um, one of um, my blind spots is that um, one of the ways I like to, to learn is by just debating things with people, okay? And I like to kind of be a devil's advocate or I like to invite a devil's advocate into things. And this was like, this is kind of how you get through grad school. You put ideas up there, then everyone sort of beats them up and then you sort of see who's, who's surviving. Um, but so, you know, that works in grad school. Um, <laughs> but I, I got out of grad school and I had a real job and I'm supposed to be part of a team. And I carry this habit, you know, it's kind of a, you know, in some ways it might say, oh, it's, you know, it's a good habit. I mean, uh, people, because people, the strength is, hey, you ask good questions or you really help me think things through. But the way it was playing out in the workplace was people thought I was argumentative, you know, like you're difficult, you're argumentative. I'm like, oh, we're just trying to think of things here. <laughs> okay. So I didn't see it, but I was putting people off by my way of learning. All right. I'll give you another example. Um, at one time I had... Uh, managed a, um, I managed a, a, a mental health clinic, okay? And so I had a team of people who reported to me and I thought I'd have this good idea of asking people for feedback on how I was doing as their, as their leader. And, um, and I will advise you to do that, but sometimes you get sort of scary results. So, um, <laughs> so I asked this of my team and, and like, I had this little item on there uh, and they rated me on how crisis oriented I was. So they put me like off the top on the top of the charts on crisis oriented. I'm like, what in the world? What are they thinking? And, uh, you know, I seem I think I'm a pretty calm guy. Um, and uh, <laughs> and uh, so what, what had happened was um, what I what I thought in myself was going to bat for my people. They saw as a weakness. What they told me was they said, look, they said, when we bring a problem to you, you're like up out of your chair trying to solve it. And someone even said, you're like the Tasmanian devil. You're like zipping around there trying to solve it. And they just said, you just cause more damage than you even solve. Sometimes we just want you to listen to us. So I thought this was a strength for me. I thought, you know, I got this team. I'm going to look out for them. If there's a problem, I'm getting right on it. But, you know, really for them, it's just like you're just creating chaos here. All right. So sometimes, sometimes something that has a little piece of strength, I looked out for my people. Um, you know, temper it with the fact that I was a little of a spaz, um, it just <laughs> made it a problem, all right? So, uh, so what I want you to do um, in, in, in your groups is I want you to take a few minutes, and I think we have about 15 minutes for this. And so I want you to tell your group about a time when you discovered or were told about a blind spot of yours. Um, I want you to just kind of share, you know, how did that come to light? How was it potentially damaging? And what have you done to manage it since the time it was initially revealed? All right. So hopefully you had a chance um, at your tables to see how a uh, blind spot can, um, can manifest itself. You've got, hopefully you've been able to share some experience about how you learned about blind spots. And maybe that's given you some ideas about how you might uncover some of your own blind spots um, as well. So, um, and and um, we will take the break at 1030. So I'm gonna, we got another 20 minutes here and we'll take a break. I'll stay uh, good and tight on our schedule there. Um, so uh, I, I wanna talk a little bit about how we help people build self-awareness, all right? Because um, self-awareness is just critical to dealing with potential derailers. And I'll say study after study after study shows that the best leaders are high in self-awareness. And you think about this, so the big task of leadership is knowing how to read a room, knowing how to say the right thing at the right time, uh, to say something that's gonna be inspiring rather than deflating. Um, to, <laughs> so, um, so much of effective leadership is built on uh, a person's self-awareness. So developing and strengthening your self-awareness is a key uh, to eliminating, minimizing your, your blind spots. Now, um, I'm gonna suggest to you that um, your reputation, how other people see you, is a better predictor of real world outcomes like success at work than your identity, your inner world, how you see yourself, okay? There's empirical data that shows this. Um, you know, uh, we all kind of, it may be true that we see ourselves more accurately than any one individual does, but, um, but it really is our reputation that predicts success at work. It's how other people see you that uh, brings you com promotions. It's how other people see you that enables you to function well as a team member, et cetera, all right? 
So, you know, part of the message there is um, uh, that we have to um, pay attention and we can gain some really valuable data when uh, we tap into other people's view of us. So, so a, couple, a, a couple things that are helpful with um, self-awareness. Um, I'm gonna say like, befriend a prophet, <laughs> befriend a prophet. And so, you know, you think like um, Saul had Samuel. Samuel told him some hard truths. Saul didn't listen very well to Samuel, Samuel but Samuel was, would tell some hard truths. Um, you know, David, who David had, he had Nathan, all right? Nathan had the courage to confront him. You think of the risk of confronting a king on something like this. Um, he had someone who was willing to tell him a hard truth that no one else would tell him. And it was only after that that David, uh, that David could get back in a healthy relationship with God. Hezekiah had Isaiah, <laughs> okay? So, uh, so look, um, befriend a prophet. Invite someone to be a truth teller in your life. Um, and I'll say also it's important to, um, to make yourself easy to criticize. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the work in uh, emotional intelligence um, and in leadership practices. You may have heard of Daniel Goleman. His name is associated with this concept of emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence is basically a combination of how well you read yourself and how well you manage your behavior and then how well you read others and, and manage social behavior. So it's sort of that um, uh, self and other management, if you're reading and management. And so um, with Goleman's work, they've studied um, leaders who, they, they looked at leaders who um, rated themselves as really high on leadership characteristics, okay? And they compared them with some, um, uh, they, um, basically what they did was they looked at leaders who were rated high or low by other people, okay? And part of what they found was that leaders who tended to rate themselves high in leadership characteristics, the people around them rated them relatively low, all right? Um, the people who rated themselves lower in, in um, those characteristics, the people around them tended to rate them a little bit higher. Um, people who seek out critical feedback are rated higher in their leadership competencies than people who, who kind of have this idea that I'm the leader, I shouldn't look vulnerable, I shouldn't ask about my weaknesses, okay? Um, you're going to be better as a leader if you make yourself easy to criticize. Um, if you Kuzes and Posner, they developed leadership practices inventory. Uh, very similar findings. Um, those, those who seek critical feedback um, are rated significantly higher in their leadership effectiveness than people who don't bother to get other people's opinions on how they lead. So, um, you know, another thing you can do um, in, whoops, I'm losing my place here. So, um, sorry, this is one where I have to scroll down on my notes here, but uh, okay, without advancing the slide. All right, so um, it's, it's helpful also just to actively seek out information that disconfirms what you believe, all right, about your leadership impact, about your team, about your organization. So, you know, with my small team, I'll often ask, you know, tell me about a couple things that, um, you know, that we're doing poorly, that, uh, that are getting in the way of you doing your work effectively, you know? Um, what are some ways that I'm getting in your way? Um, you know, seek out that critical feedback. Um, and, you know, part of this is you can't get defensive when you get it, right? <laughs> okay. Um, there's uh, uh, a, a, a guy who coaches a lot of Fortune 500 leaders. His name is Marshall Goldsmith. You may have heard of him. But I heard him speak one time and, and he talked about an exercise that I have applied and it is just really, really helpful. And it's very, very simple. He says, think about the relationships in your life and ask, how can I be a better, okay? How can I be a better spouse? How can I be a better dad? How can I be a better boss? How can I be a better daughter, all right? And um, be patient uh, in inviting those responses. So. Uh, and I, I, I'll apologize ahead of time. Sometimes I get tearful when I tell this story. But um, so I have three kids. They're adults now. And boy, girl, boy. All right. And I don't care what anybody says, but boys are easier to raise than girls. <laughs> so, so <laughs> but anyway, 
So I don't know, my kids were sort of like middle school age and you know, and I thought, well, I'm gonna ask them, you know, how can I be a better dad? And so, you know, with my sons, they're like, ah, oh, dad, you're great, no, no problem, you know? Um, but, you know, my daughter said, uh, she said, you could be a little more patient, dad, okay? And, uh, you know, oh, sorry, <clears throat> but that stung badly and it still stings me, okay? Um, but I needed to hear it because my daughter, um, uh, my daughter, she's still a talker, <laughs> okay? And I would, you know, I'd come home from work and I'm like tired from work and I'd come in and she's like talking, talking, <laughs> okay? Uh, you know, and I just, I wasn't patient with her. And, and this was a barrier to our relationship and I never would have known that if I didn't ask the question, all right? Um, so, and I think a lot of times when you ask that question, you're gonna get the, ah, oh, you're fine, you're good, yeah, no problem. Um, but you might have to say, well, think about it a little more. It's not terribly helpful for me if you don't come up with anything, <laughs> okay? So how can I be a better boss? What are two or three things I could do just to be a better boss? How can I be a better coworker of yours? Um, you, you know, um, you may have an aging parent. Ask your parent, how can I be a better son or daughter? Okay. Um, but that's, a, that's a, a really simple, really easy way to build your own self-awareness and, um, and to improve relationships. Um, you know, interesting, sometimes a, 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 a nice little a nice positive side effect of this is the other person might say, well, how can I be a better this to you, okay? Um, you know, don't look for that, <laughs> but it might come, all right? Um, but a very simple thing. Um, you know, there are assessment tools that can help with this as well. Um, you know, I talked a little bit before about this Hogan Development Survey. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm a psychologist, so I'm a little bit snobby about tools. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of personality assessments that are, you know, they're well, well marketed, but they're not very good, <laughs> okay? And, um, but, uh, you know, so uh, you wanna make sure you're using reliable and val valid ones that have a good reputation. And, you know, I was talking about these Hogan assessments, they're very solid. Um, other tools like the 16PF is one you may have heard of. Um, there's California Personality Inventory. There's a handful of these things that have empirically demonstrated strong reliability and validity. Reliability, it give, does it give you a consistent measure? Validity is, do we have empirical evidence that this thing accurately predicts behavior? Not perfectly predicts behavior, but accurately. And there's really a fairly small number of tools that do that. Um, but um, personality assessments can give you some insights uh, about yourself that will, help, that will be helpful in building your awareness. Um, 360 information. Um, now, uh, how many of you have had an anonymous 360 done on you before? Okay, yeah, so, so I kind of have mixed feelings about anonymous 360s, all right? Um, so, you know, kind of the, the going line on that is, well, if you want to hear the truth, then get people to do it anonymously, all right? Um, you know, I think you kind of need to do that in hostile cultures, hostile workplace cultures, but you miss a lot when you do that, okay? Um, uh, when, uh, you know, when people have a chance once every two years or something to give you anonymous feedback, sometimes you just get snipers, <laughs> okay? They're hiding behind the veil of anonymity and it's sort of, this is the time of year to take a shot. Um, you know, and, um, and I think it sends a couple messages even within your organization um, about what you value in your culture. And, and, uh, and I think, you know, I mean, I think a mature organization, mature people, talk directly to one another when they have a problem. And so part of the message behind an anonymous 360 is almost like, hey, um, don't tell, don't speak, it's too unsafe to speak truth to leadership here. So every once in a while, we will give you a chance to take a pot shot from behind the veil of anonymity and that's when you can do it. Um, and, uh, you, you know, I mean, I think that tells people it's not safe and we're not gonna c communicate directly around here. Um, I think the other disadvantage of those is, <laughs> You know, back in the old days, if you had an, uh, an anonymous 360, you could buy, uh, whose handwriting is that? You know, <laughs> you're like, oh, that's, all, that's, all, that's their handwriting. <laughs> you, know, you, can, <laughs> you can't do that anymore these days with the electronic ones. But, but um, you know, but I, there's oftentimes a lot of damage that's done by these and you can't go anywhere with it, right? I mean, and someone sort of lobs something out there and sometimes people just read the question wrong. Um, and, and, and sometimes, um, they, they didn't understand that they mean something very different and you don't have the chance to clarify. 
So I just say be careful with using anonymous 360s. What I think is a better way to do this um, is, is really um, instead uh, to go directly to your people and, and say, look, I'm interested in being a better leader. And, um, and uh, as someone who works with me day to day, as someone who experiences the good and bad of my leadership, um, I'm counting on you to help me get better at this. And so I'm gonna ask you some questions about how I'm doing. And I want you to err on the side of being overly critical. Um, because that's what's going to be most useful to me if you're overly critical. That'll help me figure out what I need to work on, okay? And, um, and you need to have a conversation about that. Now, the first time you do that, people are going to be, you know, dipping their toe in the pool and seeing if it's really dangerous. And um, if you get all defensive about it, um, you've blown it, all right? Um, if people are telling you the old test it out with something that's a little safe, and if you get all defensive about it, you're, you're not getting good information from there, okay? But if you respond uh, in, a, in a listening fashion, in a non-defensive fashion, and you're looking at, okay, well, could I, uh, how can I adjust? How can I, how can I respond differently to you here? And you show behavior change as a result of that, then what you're building into the culture of your organization is it's safe for us to talk like adults when we have friction points, all right? And we're gonna do it directly. We're not gonna tattle, <laughs> you know? And so this is just a better way to build trust. And I get it, that, that doesn't always work in certain really hostile environments. Um, it's not gonna, you can't do it. You have to go anonymous, but, but I would much rather, in, I would much rather foster a culture where people um, are willing to talk about the offenses they cause one another when they go directly to the source when they have a problem with somebody and then it's sniping at them and when they're willing to have a conversation about how we can improve, okay? So just some, some simple ideas on building self-awareness. Um, anyone else? I mean, as you've uh, just uh, other, uh, you know, I've thrown a couple of tactics here that might be helpful in building self-awareness. Um, anyone else care to share something that you've, that's been really helpful to you? Yeah. Yeah, can you speak a little louder? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> For a few years, she was dishonest in a few other things, <laughs> but, but you know, she's great now. <laughs> so we got past that. But okay, uh, other examples. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, I'm not so good at looking to the side. <laughs> yep. I'm wondering how the people you're asking issues can often present themselves to you as your problem mm -hmm. when they have their own issues and filter. Yeah. Then you think you need to adjust your behavior mm -hmm. when in fact yeah. so, they're not reading right or they come with their own set of Yeah, issues. sure, sure. So that's a great that's a great uh, issue to raise. And look, um, some people sometimes people are gonna misread you or it might be driven by their issues. I'll give you an example of this. Um, I supervised um, someone temporarily. Um, this is when I worked for the church. I supervised someone who was over a ministry area temporarily because the person who'd been her boss um, was out of the position. And you know, I did this sort of upward survey from her. What can I do to be a better boss? And um, one of the pieces of feedback she gave me was you could you could give more encouraging you, know, you could give more affirmation okay and um, and that's true I mean I could give more affirmation but um, she in my view she was someone who sort of peppered affirmation on things that she sort of overdid it and seemed disingenuous okay so my conversation with her was I said look um, I'm going to work to um, to ramp up the affirmation with you. Um, but it's probably not going to be to the level that really feels quite right for you, okay? So we had that conversation. And so I made it a point, um, you know, part of, part of what I do on Sunday morning is kind of walk around to the different ministry areas. So you know, I was meeting with her again in a couple of weeks and I said, you know, heard that feedback. I've been really working to give you more affirmation. Have you noticed? And she said, no, not really. <laughs> 
And I said, well, um, <laughs> you know, I said, well, do you remember when I was walking through your area the other day? And she said, yeah. I said, do you remember? I said, oh, yeah, you complimented a volunteer. You did this, you did that. And, and, and again, I mean, that was one where I just kind of had to say, you know, we differ on this. I'm going to try to adjust a little bit so that it works for you. Um, but, you know, it may not. It may not get you exactly where you want. But look, um, people are pretty forgiving of you. Um, if you listen and take something to heart, even if you don't, if people don't expect, typically they don't expect that they tell a boss something that they get to be the boss. Okay. Um, so, so, um, you know, you can tell people, I hear you. I'm going to work on making some adjustments. You can tell some people, um, I hear you. I, I get that that's frustrating for you. Here's why I do it. Okay. And that's a little different than defensiveness. Defensiveness is kind of, what are you talking about? I don't really do that. Okay. So don't get defensive, hear it out. Um, but realize um, this isn't license for you to be governed by all the people who are your subordinates. But that, that's an excellent point to raise. Yeah. One of the things I do annually is we call them skip level interviews where my direct reports, direct reports, mm -hmm. I sit down one on one. One of the questions I like to ask is, if you were me, what would you do differently? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's opened up some interesting conversations and then... Uh, Really, uh, it's an opportunity to practice humility. I just sit there and take notes, mm -hmm. and uh, I take it to heart. Even if it's coming from an imperfect source, I think there's something I can lift yeah. out of that many times, something I need to adjust. Yeah, I, I really like the way you phrase the question, too, because it, it makes it a little less threatening to them. You know, what would you do differently if you were me? It's not, you know, it's a little softer than what can I do better? So it's, you know, it's getting you the same thing. That's a really neat way to phrase it. I like that. Okay. Anyone else? One, maybe one more person talk about something that they've been able to, uh, that's been really useful to them in building their self-awareness. Maybe one other example. Okay, well, let's take our break one minute early. Um, so we're on break from uh, 1029 to, we're still going all the way to 1045 though on our break. So you get an extra bonus minute. <laughs> so, so we'll go to 1045, thanks. We'll come back in a bit. <laughs> 